David the was great. Which one? Scott, why am I the only guy with the time? You didn't get the memo, right? I didn't. You're also the only guy with hair. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, I'm so Ray Nagin has got a problem with hair. <laughs> so you're trying to be here. Here we, we can get away with it here. You're among friends. <laughs> okay, let's see. All right, let me see. So I got it. So I'll talk to it. Double display. Let's say apply. Is it talking? There it goes. It didn't get any bigger. Okay. We'll start here. And okay, go ahead. Okay. There it goes. All right, so, um, all right. So Dave Woolworth is our final presenter for this evening. He uh, received his Bachelor of Science degree in um, me mechanical engineering yeah, it was. in 1991 from the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, and then got a master's in physics uh, in 2000 from the University of Mississippi. So he has been studying acoustics, acoustic vibrations, the effects of sound for a very long time. Uh, he's also very familiar with the role of sound because he is also a working and performing musician. And he, among other things, is someone who has been tasked by the New Orleans City Council with doing an acoustical analysis of some of the issues going on in the French Quarter, as many of you are aware. And so I got to know Dave recently and was thrilled to make his acquaintance and that he also accepted our invitation to come and speak this evening about some of the issues that we're also concerned about. So with that, Dave Woolworth. Thank you, Scott, and I, I appreciate you all having me here. Um, uh, and to David Dixon, uh, the, uh, the uh, I didn't try hypnosis. I normally tell my children, you either practice the violin or you can clean the toilet. It's like one or the other. I'm kind of, a, that's the way I roll with things like that. So, you know, you gotta, you gotta know something when you leave this house and go to, when you, okay. So, um, uh, uh, the study was commissioned by the city um, council officially in January of 2012 and was intended to, uh, to be completed by April of 2012. Um, with the patience and permission of uh, Councilwoman Palmer uh, uh, and her office, uh, Nicole Weber, um, uh, we have reacted to the findings uh, to ensure the study was more complete by adjusting the scope and uh, the length of time spent working on it. Um, the recommendations uh, are meant to, uh, to be, they're given to the city. These are my recommendations to the city, and so that the city will then figure out what to do with those recommendations. So. Um, now, uh, here, uh, ironically, if you look at this, um, I took the acronym, and it, it shows a bit of urgency here, SOS. Um, uh, we do need to do something. So, um, so let's start with, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to run you down this, we'll do a purpose, uh, describe the study a little bit, uh, show what our target is, and then we'll touch on our recommendations and uh, some of the act things that are actually going on. So first, the purpose modified uh, was to provide information recommendations on the soundscape and the sound ordinance, uh, not only to the city council, but also to provide information to the community as a whole. Um, the, uh, uh, the city brought me on to look at the, the soundscape and the ordinance, and they wanted particular attention to the areas of Bourbon Street and Frenchman Street um, that had the lion's share of the uh, complaints controversy and the lawsuits. And uh, the study is broader and more in-depth than intended as a result of trying to show the complexity and interconnectedness of the issues. Um, this is to facilitate the conversation that we keep talking about so that people can all start from a, 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 a point. And one of, the, one of the things that drove that was uh, in my interviews with a lot of people, there, there was disparate information, whether it, be, whether it be organizations or individuals are, you know, providing completely um, opposite information. So I had to dig pretty deep to to start figuring out so we could really come to some common ground on the very basics before we move forward. Um, uh, and then uh, the also the, 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 the extra part of the, uh, of the report was to provide a roadmap for the future. So the idea was that now we wouldn't just say, well, here's what we recommend, see you later. But no, we're going to have a chance to really, we can take this and build on it. And we can project what we might do to, because to, we're not going to be finished right away. It's, it's a process as we were seeing also with our other presenters. Um, we did not cover concerts and festivals. 
uh, industrial noise, highway noise, or construction noise. That was not in this uh, scope. Um, but uh, let's take a look at this. This is how um, once things, the ball got rolling, this is really what it came down to. There's a whole set of issues uh, to, to do the overview uh, or to do the study. And we start with the soundscape history. We study complaints, uh, legal issues, and uh, uh, that is also executive. Um, community resources, health and safety, tourism and culture. I'm just reading this so, so uh, for those that can't read it up here. Ordinance analysis, and, uh, and there's a set of sound studies, which uh, that's sort of where I was starting, but this is sort of what came out of it. So if I look at this, um, let's get rid of those guys and start here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch on a few of these things, um, but we, uh, we're not going to go into the ordinance analysis and health effects, but I want to note that um, health effects of unwanted sound are very real and very serious, and um, uh, problems start with an inability to get sleep or, or to relax in your own home, and from there it can get progressively worse. So. Um, when the report comes out, there's lots and lots of information. You can find that on the web and all that. But this is more, I'm going to touch on things that are maybe a little more specific to, to here. Um, let's see. Um, and these are very, the report's in, in much more depth than this, but uh, there's just some ideas. 200 years of the most brass bands in the world in the city. So this is embedded in, in the culture, as we talk about the culture. Um, we should understand that the soundscape of a city is tied directly to its, its uh, uh, industry and commerce, okay? That's very important, and right now, um, we know that, 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 uh, that commerce is tourism, or a large part of our uh, industry here. So um, the residential footprint of New Orleans remained small for the first 200 years, half the size of uh, what it is today. Um, and before that, very small. So, um, and one other thing that's happened is that our soundscape has changed in the way that there's a lot more of this low frequency uh, sound in music, and it's sort of a, a, something that's a phenomenon since 1980. Uh, more amplification has become cheaper uh, for low frequencies, and the music, just like chamber music was composed for chambers and the romantic music was composed for larger spaces, now people compose music to use these large, heavy subwoofer sound systems. And the we're going to find later, we'll talk more about it, but these places weren't built for that. Okay, and so that's something that's, that's changed a little bit. Um, uh, let's see uh, if I got, got all that, I think. Oh, uh, okay, there we go. Now, I'm just, this, uh, Rich Campanell, this is a picture from his work. It shows that the blue is the 1700s, the green is the 1800s, and then the 1900s is there, the yellow. So, and it's what's interesting to note about the, uh, the footprint here, um, is that uh, the tourist footprint is actually some of the most historical homes. And, and there's, what, 40,000 on the register here, and there's even more than that. So these homes are, are old, okay? And that's something we have to understand. Um, but our tourist footprint is, is really based around a very small area. Um, this is another map uh, from the Historic New Orleans collection, and it shows, you can see, I don't know if you can see them, but there's green lines that represent the trolleys, the red lines represent the train lines running right through the city, okay? And then the canals that are now, some of them are filled in. All this commerce was going on back then, so it was quite a busy time. There were steam engines running, steam factories running on either side of Canal Street, so, and then Walden, Waldenburg Park, of course, was all industrial and loading zones. So, uh, there was a very different sound. That straight line that goes from Pontchartrain down to the Mississippi is Elysian Fields. So, that's, that was steam trains running back and forth all day long. So, there's something we have to think about before we, um, uh, you know, think about what we have now. Maybe, maybe it's actually quieter in some, in some places. So, the, the soundscape shifts with the commerce. That's sort of what I'm trying to get at there. Um, let's look at some of the complaints, um, just briefly. Um, the complaints have been around as long as there have been uh, these parades and then the industrial activities. Um, the current complaints come from all uh, places, from businesses and residents uh, to musicians even complaining about things, um, bars complaining about other bars. Okay, so, uh, but it's not limited to uh, music or cultural expression, but uh, we're focusing a little bit on that, so I'm gonna say that that's um, something we should be aware of. Um, and the low frequency pulsing sounds are now a new complaint, okay? Um, let's see, uh, 
uh, these complaints are a lot about the quality of life. And it, what's funny is we talked about quality of life. In this project, I've thought, well, quality of life must mean getting sleep, peace and quiet. But a lot of people have said quality of life means lots of activity today. So it's kind of an interesting uh, juxtaposition. What does quality of life now mean? You know, uh, uh, and we have quality of life police, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, I'll move on from that. And, and there are also uh, uh, people who uh, are fine with the current uh, state of affairs, okay, even though there's people who are complaining. And some of these people live, I've interviewed them side by side. One house is people who said, I'm furious. The next people say, I don't see a problem. So, so you know, do we have a good record of complaints? Unfortunately, no, no. But uh, we can, we'll talk about that too. Um, so we ask questions like, what's too loud? What's too late? How long is too long? These are things we have to start evaluating. Um, and the consensus on these issues is elusive. And it has been elusive for many years, um, uh, or maybe as long as this has been going on. Uh, but uh, so we need to pick an achievable goal. That's sort of the object, what we're getting to. Pick an achievable goal and then um, and weigh in a number of issues uh, outside that and, and, and look at the average expectations. Start with that as a starting point. So. Uh, uh, we'll move on to uh, legal issues. And now, um, originally, the NOPD enforced a subjective ordinance from the 1800s uh, to 1959, I believe, when they had the, the municipal code. Uh, and then it still was objective. And then finally, in 72, the EPA uh, got involved with uh, uh, the EPA was created, and it, it suggested that noise was a, an important component of uh, per the environment. So uh, by 1981, New Orleans had its own code that involved decibel levels. 82, they had officers and sound level meters. Uh, and then uh, by 86, the funding dried up and it was handed back to the police. Okay, and, and then, so now the police have had it since then. And uh, one thing, it's been inc inconsistent. And, and I think we can all agree that that's been a problem. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, but th there's, there's, pro th they, they have a lot to do um, uh, in their defense. Uh, you know, having worked with the police during this project, uh, the prioritization of duties, the time commitment to measuring. I mean, I spend hours outside measuring, and they don't have that kind of time. Um, they, uh, they have uh, uh, judicial pr procedures aren't very good for getting a conviction or getting any, so they write a ticket and it ends up going to go to court and it ends up saying, sent back. So they don't really have an incentive to do very much about it. Um, they have poor measurement procedures in the, in the view Carre. They have lack of manpower, and they have a lack of equipment and training. So, yeah. Well, it, uh, I think some people there have been police officers who have actually done a, a very good job of it. But but uh, you know they, you have to maintain this over time. There's been nobody in charge of it, in particular for the whole duration. So it's very difficult to get continuity and consistency, and that's what we're having problems with. So, I mean, I know I'm not, I'm preaching to the choir here, but I'm just outlining it. Um, so they tend to get a lot of the blame, too. Um, and on the legislative end, there's uh, complexities include constitutionality, uh, having to uh, create rules that are fair, um, and the interconnectedness of the issues becomes evident every time they try to revise something, uh, and they have arguments over allowable decibel limits and such things. So I think this is, been going, this is a, a, another problem. And then you go to the judicial part, and you say, uh, you find out that uh, uh, in the 80s, they had an adjudication process through the health department, which worked pretty well. But that fell away. And now it's considered a criminal conviction to, uh, to break the noise ordinance. And it goes to municipal court, and it tends to get confused. And then these things uh, don't work out very well. It's proved ineffective and inappropriate. So uh, and then we move on to the sound studies, which is my favorite part. Um, took some sound sa samples around the whole city and listened to different, just different sounds, just listened to the city. Um, a lot of people just come up and say, what are you doing? I'm like, shh, we're, we're listening. And it was good, it's nice because there's a lot of people who really want to talk about it. <laughs> Measuring. So. Uh, <laughs> Um, there, uh, I measured sound levels in clubs, and it very, very wide uh, variation. Um, uh, and also in the samples of the city, we also measured, we studied transient sounds versus continuous sounds. So it's not just how loud, but how often, or how continuous these things happen. So there's a whole, no, there's, and there's many more dimensions to these sounds. Um, but, but we took a, little, a look at that. Um, 
I studied the way sound propagated in the French Quarter, that is, from inside the club to the door of the club to across the street to down half a block to a block away. And just a repeat of these studies over several, I'll call them geographies, and, and that way we get, a, we get an average idea of what's going on. Uh, and then um, I also t uh, studied uh, nine historical homes and blasted the front of their houses with sound and saw what came through. But we, we looked at the houses, all the different styles, uh, Victorian, the Creole Cottage, but several samples of each, and in states of repair and disrepair. So we start to understand what's the average, okay? Um, one thing that was, uh, we found in this um, was the sound penetration of the historical homes. Uh, it, uh, we found the average, but surprisingly, that structures in disrepair were more susceptible to sound coming in, and well-kept, well-insulated, and well-sealed structures were more resistant, okay? So that's, this may seem like common sense, but people say, well, you know, I can hear it. And they say, well, shut the window, or, <laughs> you, know, you know, things like that. Um, uh, you know, and, and, and I want to also, I want to also note that, that, uh, that, that typical structures with single pane windows are more susceptible to the low frequency problem, okay? Uh, what's in between you and the rest of the world is, a, is an eighth inch of glass, is what it is. So, so some things that need to be thought about. So part of the report also gets into telling people about their homes and telling people about uh, the, the bar rooms, about their bars, and how sound travels through things and how to improve their quality of life through you know, what, you know, various means. So. Um, the next part uh, got into, or, or I'm going to talk about tourism culture. Um, we know that uh, music is tied directly to our to the culture, and that music tourism uh, and tourism being an econom a huge part of the economy, um, music tourism is a large part of that. Okay, um, it, interesting that the the uh, Bourbon Street culture, uh, and Rich talked about it in, in the late '60s. You know, this became this kind of party in the street atmosphere, and that has been around for what is it, uh, 70, 40 years, right? 40 some years. So it sort of becomes part of what we experience here or people expect and, and is promoted to uh, tourism wise as well. It's sort of, it's promoted in a way. Um, uh, let's see, the, uh, the, the traditional cultural expression, uh, expressions are uh, especially jazz funerals are protected under law and have a, have a task force, okay? Um, the, the, so we know that that exists. Um, and then the other thing, this is very interesting about the complications of this cultural phenomenon about our street musicians, is that everyone has a different sonic footprint. How big, how big of an area do you influence, you know, when you're speaking or when you're shouting or whatever it is, okay? Uh, uh, and the sonic footprint, um, the different instrumentation uh, or the use of amplification can dictate the size of this, okay? So the rules have to accommodate the variability of these things. Um, here's a nice picture to give you an idea. Just here's some, like a louder and quieter uh, sonic footprints. And you see that you can dominate up to a block with various sources. Um, another complication uh, that we come upon in this is the tourism numbers grow and the musicians take advantage of this by playing on the street. We have to deal with a limited tourism footprint and an even more limited busking footprint. And the buskers are your street musicians. So now everybody's looking for space, and then, and people are bringing, uh, we'll get to this in a second, the inevitable overlap of these sonic footprints, not to mention the residents who now get music, more often whether they like it or not. So now you have a lot more people in a smaller, in the same size place, okay? And then uh, one more difficulty of the city, this is, this is the complications of this um, a problem, one more difficulty of the city is the brass instruments and drums, which we have lots of and are growing more of, um, are capable of the highest sound levels. Uh, if you think about the orchestra, there's one trombone or maybe two trombones and 40 some violins, right? They, they, their sound power capabilities are much higher. So these are powerful instruments. Add a drum, it gets, it gets pretty loud. So, or it's capable of being loud, okay? Um, the advent of cheaper portable amplification adds to this problem. Um, and so I suspect that the dynamics meaning, you know, forte, fortissimo, pianissimo, um, are going to become a key component to the future negotiations on the street music issue. How do we deal with the dynamics? So um, here's a nice picture for you. Um, can't we just get along? These are all our friends in the, in the French Quarter. Uh, all, 
okay. Uh, I think the one up there is, you can see the street performer and the club owner and the musician. I think Councilwoman Palmer is in there. Um, where is she? <laughs> the, uh, uh, the, the <laughs> thank you. Um, these kittens have, I'm gonna just tell you what I think about what, what this represents to me. Um, these kittens having a tea party represent all of the parties crammed in together in the French Quarter. And then the, the tablecloth under the table settings represents the soundscape, okay? If there are any changes to the soundscape to be made, everyone at the table is affected to some degree. And everyone needs to stop what they're doing to participate in the process so that you can go back to having the tea party. So, um, it requires an effort, an effort on all everybody's part and to work together to get back to business if you're trying to change this, this basically this tapestry of sound that's around you, okay? Um, I'm just gonna touch on this uh, cultural expressions. Um, we have, uh, in, in New Orleans, there's the parades, um, and this has been going on since the 1700s, the jazz funeral since the 1800s. The Mardi Gras Indians, uh, su surprisingly, it wasn't until the 60s, they've been around for, for a long time, uh, but only in the late 60s did they become, with, with the same time as Bourbon Street, uh, changed to its street, more street party culture, that's when they, they uh, curbed the violence and started more with the, uh, the, uh, the, so the picking up the needle and thread as part of the battle. So that's, that's uh, interesting that those have been around for both 40 years. Um, music has been part of the city for a long time. From, uh, that is street music from the 1830s easily. Parties, people have had parties and, and orchestras and music in their courtyards for, for years. Uh, clubs have been around and festivals, of course. So, um, and then in Bourbon Street, is that a cultural expression or is it, it but it certainly is part of our culture, right? It's part, of, it's part of what, it's been around for 40 years. Is it part of our culture? That may be a question I ask. Trying to get rid of it. Well, the, that, that's, that's true, but I mean, but, but the, the tourism sort of exploits that. It leverages these things. And so um, there's a commercialization of some of these more, uh, let's call it pure cultural expressions, and it blurs the lines of the protected culture. I think this is maybe something that we, will come up as time goes on. Because if there's money to be made, people are gonna try to make it, right? Um, the target for our recommendations here, uh, or mine, um, are to provide the relief to the neighborhoods while at the same time minimize the impact on the tourist economy and cultural expressions. Okay, so that's easy, easy to say. Um, and, and utilize this quality of life, economic, cultural balance. Uh, now, these are really great. Now, now I'm going to get to the recommendations and I'll be ready to duck at any time. <laughs> what are the recommendations? Okay. Um, we're going to create a dedicated sound officer or officers to educate about and enforce sound regulations. Okay, we have to start. We have to start. Oh, good. I'm on the, I'm on the right path. Um, the, the, uh, well, they can not only can they educate the public, but they can work with clubs and sound sources to meet the regulations, uh, determine effectiveness of the ordinances as they're put in place or ones that exist, um, maintain a database of complaints so we can understand where things are coming from and going over time. Uh, troubleshoot complaints, because we need, we need somebody to go and visit these people and make sure that we can try to solve the problems. Uh, monitor citywide noise, and just so we understand the changes in our soundscape over time. Uh, regularly, and of course this communication that we keep talking about, regularly meet with the clubs, the residents, and the other organizations to keep these communication lines open and be proactive. Uh, and then this also centralizes the sound issue to an individual or individuals so that somebody, somebody said, well, it's his job or her job or whatever it is. Now it's somebody's job. I you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Um, uh, we're going to move, uh, we're, we're going to recommend moving sound violations to civil offenses away from criminal. Uh, uh, for Bourbon Street, we're discussing a sound level cap. And the idea is just to say, this is it. No louder than this. It can, and, and the thing is, this allow, what I, my measurements have allowed me to say, okay, you can lose your hearing inside the club and still meet this outside. Mm -hmm. And for those that don't want, want to leave their doors or, or can't get it, it isn't loud enough inside, they just have to shut their facades. It'll be that simple. And, and I think we, I've tried to streamline and simplify it, but you know, we'll, we'll see how this works. But uh, I had the cooperation of the folks from Funky 544 and a couple other clubs, and we went and tested to see how well it would work, and it works pretty well. 
So I'm confident that we're, we're moving in a, in a good direction. Um, uh, we're going to add, add parts to deal with a low-frequency pulsing noise, an actual metric to deal with that, okay? Um, uh, we're going to create a mechanism to address the complaints that's inside of our uh, uh, sound officer. Um, an interesting thing that, uh, that I'm, I'm proposing is to survey the French Quarter and, f and other hotspots to better understand the specifics. Talk to everyone and find out what everybody thinks, because some surprising things come out of these types of investigations. Um, uh, this is part of that proactive approach to uh, uh, solve problems, that is troubleshooting. Um, there is, these, th this is, this is a, a, a little touchy, but uh, to create, the expand the tourist footprint in areas of less impact on residents. The idea would be that as long as the money was there for the people who were working there and the tourists were coming, this is a very viable option. Now, as you move towards the river, the sound will travel across the river to Algiers, and then Ms. Palmer will have all sorts of other problems. <laughs> but she's not here to, to <laughs> 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 Yeah, she, <laughs> anyway, uh, so we talk also about incentives uh, for, for venues uh, that host cultural expressions. So if somebody says, I'm exclusively going to do brass bands, hey, maybe we can give them a break so that they can host brass bands all day long. So these people have a place to play. Um, uh, I'm going to, give me a second here to, uh, uh, this is the last part of it, and give me a second on this, and then I'll get to my last slide. Um, there's, there's been a couple moments about talking about broken trust in the city, about uh, disbelief that the, the, the city can deal with it, or the police can deal with it, or anything like that. And so um, there has to be recovery of this trust. And uh, uh, so with this, this also has led to some people not want to want to talk to me. You know, because I'm just making recommendations. But they say, no, no, you're, you're part of the city. And they don't want to talk to me even. So that's, it, it's, it's disheartening, but this has to be regained. And so we, uh, some of the things was uh, consistency, of course, was, the, was one of the biggies. Um, active lines of communication, of course. Uh, uh, and then one of the things that we're, the approach is not to just come down with a hammer and be done with it or, or, or turn a switch and tomorrow will be done. It's, it's an incremental and iterative process. It's not overnight, requires people's cooperation and action, and it's too big and complicated to be fully solved by the passing of a law or hiring of a, of a person. But the iterative process must be also available due to the interconnectedness of the issues and the potentially unforeseen effects and obstacles that occur. So we have to be able to iterate it. It's not uh, the lost pass, we're done. Um, uh, the proactive process requires interaction with the uh, sound sources and receivers, uh, everybody. Uh, the education of the people, and, and we were educating in terms of sound health, that is hearing loss, hearing protection, annoyance, uh, being a good neighbor. Being a good neighbor is one of the things that really came out. You know, if you're a good player and we can all work together then, and, and we have somebody in charge of this, we can show you, we can get, we can get somewhere with that. But if somebody decides they don't want to cooperate, those are the people that will probably end up with tickets, right? Um, uh, another to, gain the the, to, to regain the trust uh, is this dedicated sound officer, somebody who can always be there or you can call, uh, and a, a system that would involve a com registering complaints and answering them. Uh, collecting information on the street level as well, because this allows us to understand that uh, more clearly, because if we were done with it, all of a sudden it, it always rears its head. They, they deal with it and then it rears its head. So, so we try to break that cycle and break the cycle of lawsuits and things like that. Instead, try to get things that can be achievable. So um, uh, what's going on right now? This is really great because one of the benefits of it going a little longer than expected is that we've had a chance to talk about things and start working towards things. Um, and, and we've seen a few of these already, but some clubs are making efforts to really soundproof and monitor themselves. Siberia runs out with sound level meters. Um, the, uh, uh, let me see, uh, there was a, who do I have here? Uh, uh, Le bon did went through a process not long ago. Uh, the DBA has done a good job. Blue Nile's about to do some work. Mimi's is working on some iterations for soundproofing. So, as long as this attitude persists and people start coming to the table like this, say, hey, I'm going to take responsible for my footprint, then we're, we're, and we're, we can work with them, then maybe this is a really good direction to go. Um, uh, uh, the, uh, there are discussions right now. Uh, I've, been to, I've been speaking to Mac, no, uh, uh, that's the uh, Music and, and Culture Coalition uh, and the French Quarter Citizens, to start talking to the street musicians. Some of these things really need to be dealt with on a local level. 
you know, and so we'll see how well this works, but this is already, we're trying to get there. So this is what's, this is what's going on right now. And if anybody else wants to volunteer after this. Um, <laughs> City Hall is getting ready to hire a dedicated environmental specialist and to change the sound violations for criminal civil. So this is already in motion. Uh, uh, and uh, the city is working with the Bywater Neighborhood Association to develop an arts and culture overlay in the Bywater section of St. Claude. They're working together to develop this as well. Um, and it says right here at the bottom, also there is a report on this whole thing due come out mid-May after Jazz Fest. So, <laughs> <laughs> I think. So, so um, <laughs> oh, no, no, uh, not, not, not like that, just so that it doesn't, so that we have time to iter to implement it and figure it out, to iterate it. Um, and there, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Okay.